Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the sixth annual Fulbright Distinguished Lecture to be given this year by Professor Michael Ignatieff. My name's Paul Madden. I'm a Pro Vice Chancellor at the University as well as Chairman of the Conference of Colleges and my own college is, is Queen's. The Vice Chancellor very much regrets that she can't be here today. It's a talk that she would love to have heard herself but she sends her warm regards to everybody who's here. First things first, should the fire alarm start to ring? It's not something which has been planned and so guests should exit the auditorium via the doors at either side. I always wanted to do that. And <laughs> head out onto Brewer Street. The designated gathering point, if this should happen, is in front of the gym uh, on, on Brewer Street. And secondly, could, I make sh could you make sure that all your phones have been switched off, not just on silent, switched off? Before I pass you over to Professor Mark Philp, who will introduce Professor Ignatieff, let me say a few brief words about the lecture series and the broader Fulbright initiative. Yes, even heads of house, right, yeah. <laughs> Senator William Fulbright was an alumnus of Pembroke College and, of course, of the university. He arrived in Oxford in 1925 as a Rhodes Scholar, reading history. I'd like to single out two aspects of his broader political contributions. The first, in support of the engagement of the United States in international peacekeeping and the United Nations, led to the programme of international educational grants for fellows and scholars that bears his name. Fulbright is synonymous with the use of cultural diplomacy to build relationships across countries by bringing people together. The greatest movement of scholars across the face of the earth since the fall of Constantinople in 1453, said a previous master of Pembroke, Ronald McCallum, and once Fulbright's tutor. He said that in 1963. I personally benefited from a Fulbright scholarship in 1970 Immediately after graduating, it enabled me in part to spend two years at UCLA doing postgraduate study, a period I'd acknowledge as one of the cornerstones of my subsequent academic career and uh, as an unreconstructed 20-year-old Bradfordian at the time, enormously broadening of my uh, personal perspectives. The second important aspect of Fulbright's contributions was his willingness to speak out against arbitrary and abusive power. Fulbright was the sole vote in the Senate against funding the McCarthy Committee, and he used his powerful voice and position to speak out forcefully against the Vietnam War, and as his book aptly titled it, The Arrogance of Power. This Fulbright initiative was launched a number of years ago by Pembroke alumnus Brian Wil Wilson, Professor Sir uh, Adam Roberts, cultural diplomacy historian Dick Arndt, and Graham McCallum, Ronald's nephew. Their aim was to establish a permanent memorial to Fulbright in the form of an endowed chair in Pembroke and in the Department of Politics and International Relations. While we maintain our commitment to that holy grail, we've already succeeded in other ways. The firm establishment of this public lecture in the Oxford calendar is one of those marks of success. The other is a programme of visiting Fulbright professors established each year at Pembroke and in the Department for Politics and International Relations. We've thus had success not only in attracting attention to the Fulbright initiative, but also to bring Fulbright's intellectual legacy through these annual lectures and a seminar programme organised by the visiting professor, events which will continue for years to come. Roberta Foote Fulbright, one of Senator Fulbright's daughters, sadly died last year after starting to give generously to this cause on the advice of her daughter Julia, herself an alumna of Pembroke. And it's thanks to a very generous legacy from Roberta that this annual celebration of the Fulbright name at Pembroke and Oxford continues. In addition to the Fulbright family, I'd like to thank all of the sponsors, particularly Penny Egan at the UK-US Fulbright Commission, the Lewis Roth Foundation and the Fulbright Alumni Association, as well as, of course, of my colleagues here in Pembroke and in the Department of Politics and International Relations. 
Previous speakers in the series have fully met our objective of being either academics or practitioners in the field of international relations, broadly defined. They include to two Nobel laureates, Harold Varmus for medicine and Joe Stiglitz for economics, as well as two stellar US ambassadors and a distinguished Princeton professor. All our speakers have shared Fulbright's commitments to internationalism and willingness to speak uncomfortable truths. I'd now like to hand you over to Professor Mark Philp to ask him to introduce the sixth annual distinguished Oxford Fulbright lecturer, Professor Michael Ignatieff. Right. Um, Mr. Pro Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege and pleasure to have been asked to introduce Professor Michael Ignatieff. Edward R. Morrow, Professor of Practice at the Shornstein Centre in John F. Kennedy School of Government, and now President and Rector-Designate of the Central European University in Budapest. It, it is, however, something of a daunting prospect, although the principal difficulty is brevity. It may be the soul of wit, but it's not quite the same thing as doing justice to a distinguished career in history, political theory, government, literature and the arts and, in the best possible sense, in journalism. Historians will know his just measure of pain, the study of the prison in the late 18th century and early 19th century, and his major contribution to the King's College Cambridge political economy project, uh, particularly the volume edited by, with uh, Istvan Hont, Wealth and Virtue, which played such an important role in the recovery of early political economy and the seminal understanding the seminal contribution of the Scottish Enlightenment. Political theorists will know his needs of strangers, which in the teeth of both analytic Rawlsianism and deeply contextual Skinnerianism, managed to say something both deep and cogent and also moving about our understanding of human needs in ways that students and ordinary members of the public could understand and which challenged theorists of justice to think harder about both foundationalism and relativism. <coughs> and theorists of nationalism and international relations and political realism more generally have a wide range of texts, Blood and Belonging, The Warrior's Honour, The Rights Revolution, Human Rights as Politics and Idolatry, The Lesser Evil, and Fires, uh, Fire and Ashes. And of course there's also a family memoir, The Russian Album, several novels, and a biography of Isaiah Berlin, and I'm wholly confident that I've missed something. Uh, not least prizes in literature uh, and his work in relation to television. One thing that I've deferred mentioning, rather than forgotten, is his political career. First as a Liberal MP in the Canadian Parliament, and then as leader of the Liberal Party in Canada, in which he narrowly escaped becoming head of government. For a genuinely accomplished historian, political philosopher and intellectual to achieve political office and to be able to have politicians talk to him and work with him is in many respects his greatest achievement since they are a pretty sceptical bunch and they're very unforgiving. His political career is a testament both to his character and his personal qualities and to his commitments as a liberal, both with a capital and a small or lowercase l. In that capacity, he sought to influence the exercise of power and the conduct of his state in an international arena in which liberalism is both our only recourse and constantly under pressure from those who deny that there are irreducible standards or minimum thresholds that we should be striving to secure for all people and who reject principles of a tolerance and respect for diversity and difference within and between nations. But he did not do so as a starry-eyed liberal. He recognised this pluralism often forces states to reflect on what implications being liberal has for us when we have to choose between different means to preserve liberal, liberal values and liberal societies. And those are tough choices. It's Michael's understanding of what pluralism really involves and his recognition of the fragility of the political and international order that allows such a state to be one of flourishing rather than outright conflict, which makes it such an important voice in both the academic and practical worlds of politics. And voice, I think, is a key term. 
for it is by tone, measure and restraint, by a certain essential rhetoric of persuasion that this plural world is held together. And that is a world he understands deeply and that his works eloquently evoke. In the light of the current crisis, we can have no one better able to help us reflect on the refugee crisis in Europe or to help us articulate how we can respond to the needs of these strangers. Can I ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Michael Ignatieff to give the sixth Fulbright Distinguished Lecture in International Relations. Uh, that was a very touching introduction. Um, I felt my whole life flash before my eyes, and I'm very touched that it comes from a man I respect so much. I also look across the room and see a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues from whom I've learned all my life, and I think it's the first time in my life I've walked into a room with two beetles preceding me, so I feel very grand and special. Uh, I should tell you, although Oxford and, and uh, Pembroke may not be happy to hear this, that there were two preceding uh, Fulbright lectures which I gave at the University of Edinburgh and in another place called King's College London on Wednesday. One of the comic features of British academic life is that Edinburgh didn't want to admit that I was going to Oxford or King's College, and King's College reciprocated in the same way and I think Pembroke believes that the only Fulbright lecture worth talking about is their Fulbright lecture. So I, this is an example of pluralism in action. And I, I, um, uh, joking, aside, joking aside, I'm extremely honored and pleased and delighted to be here and thank the um, Vice Chancellor uh, and her representative for, for being here. All right, let's do some work. Um, what do I want to do here? Um, my, uh, let me say a little thing uh, about the title. I hope at the end of the hour, and it will take me an hour, I'm afraid, um, you will have a better idea, we will have a better idea of what is to be done. Uh, but first of all, I think we need to start with what is to be understood. Uh, there are some things to be understood here that are difficult. The thing I want us to focus on understanding is what seems to me an important gap between how the refugee crisis is understood by international relations scholars and professionals of human rights, how it's understood in the vernacular of human, human rights, and how it's understood in the language of practical politics. There seems to me a serious gap between these two languages. And I'm going to take you into uncomfortable territory, not in order to disavow human rights, not in order to disavow the right of asylum, but to show how vulnerable it has become politically in the domestic discourse of Western liberal states. So that's kind of the menu. Uh, and I'm taking you to places that make me uncomfortable, and I hope it will make you uncomfortable. And then we'll figure out why we're so uncomfortable, and I hope we'll come out renewing uh, our moral and emotional commitment to rights of asylum and rights of non refoulement but with a deeper understanding of whom we have to persuade and what arguments we have to engage with if we're going to sustain uh, a generous, expansive, and humane refugee policy uh, for Europe. Um, okay, let's, I, I, I have a few slides. My wife always says that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm going to corrupt you a little bit, um, but this is, these are heuristic devices. Um, the first thing, obviously, is that this is not just a European crisis. We're looking at a global crisis. The International Organization of Migration is estimating 60 million people on the move, a mixture of economic migrants, survival migrants, to use a a phrase made familiar by the incredibly important work of the Oxford uh, Refugee Studies Center. Of these, 15 million are refugees fleeing persecution and civil conflict. Of these, then in turn, an enormously high percentage uh, are fleeing countries 
that are in uh, acute phases of, of civil conflict. The drivers of migration, this is not a, this is not a, a lecture on uh, the sources and drivers of migration, but we need to have some of the background. Uh, we are dealing with um, the crisis of post-colonial and post-imperial self-determination still running on with many states consolidating into stable forms of order, but many states fracturing and collapsing and spewing uh, refugees out uh, in, through civil war and state failure. We're also, as some, many of you students are keenly aware, uh, one of the drivers of migration is, is climate change. You can't go to West Africa, watch the desert creeping southward onto the arable land that sustains small farming in West Africa, and then see the trucks of men loading up at night to cross the desert for the life-threatening journey across the Sahara and then across Libya without understanding that uh, climate change refugees are not something we ought to think about tomorrow. It's happening now, and it's an enormous driver of the pressures that are hitting Europe. I will present the refugee and migration challenge as a challenge, but let's also remember it's an enormously positive development in other senses. All the economists and some of the de distinguished development economists at Oxford will tell you that the remittance income from migration is a key source of economic development opportunity throughout uh, particularly West Africa, through the Middle East. Many countries are standing up, if they're standing up at all, because of the remittances coming from uh, migrants. Uh, and the International Organization of Migration is estimating that at $601 billion a year, which dwarfs anything that overseas development aid state to state uh, is doing for development in the developing world. I want to put an emphasis also on something else which again is familiar to, which is the mobility revolution. Why, are, why is migration such a pressure? Simply because the real cost of transport have fallen in real terms, and the social distance between zones of safety and zones of refuge has been collapsed by the internet and the digital revolution. And all of you will know that when the refugees swim ashore in Lesbos and they are asked by inquiring journalists what was the one thing you couldn't afford to lose uh, in the, as you swam for your life, they all tell you the cell phone. The cell phone to establish their linkages backwards into Syria to tell their mum and dads they made it, to establish their linkage forwards to Dusseldorf and Stuttgart. So the mobility re revolution is a crucial uh, part of collapsing these distances that used to make migration an impossible dream for millions of people and now is a, a lived reality. The other reason, obviously, why we have a migration crisis more approximately has been the often catastrophic consequences of Western failed interventions, A, in Libya, which destroyed the state order, which was up to that point uh, essentially providing migration protection for Italy and the interventions in Iraq which have destabilized the political order in Iraq and Syria with the consequences we know. Let me then very briefly refer to the geopolitics of migration in relation to Syria. We're looking at the Arab, obviously the the Arab Spring turning to the Arab Winter, and a long-running crisis of, Ar of, the, of, of, of autocracy in the Arab world, which is going to run for a very long time. And by autocracy, I don't just mean the crisis of the Ba'ath regime in Syria. Um, just think about what you're looking at if you're the president of France and looking at the geriatric regime in Algeria. Uh, France is looking across the Mediterranean and looking at a regime which has known vicious civil war in the seven, 1990s and if that regime crashes looks at uncontrolled migration from Algeria uh, as a sequelae of state failure in Algeria, possibly Morocco. So folks, we're in for a long 21st century story of, of uh, migratory pressure. Uh, we're also looking at um, we all think um, 
in our self-congratulatory way that multiculturalism and multi-ethnicity is something that liberal democracies invented. And then we, when we look out beyond our shores, we discover, in fact, that there have been patterns of multiculturalism and multi-ethnicity that date back centuries, among them Ottoman multi-ethnicity, Shia, Sunni, Yazidi, Christian, living together in very complex social forms that go back centuries now being pulverized by uh, the madness of uh, Islamic sectarianism and uh, the radicalization of Islam. All of this is, is, are, 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 the, are, are, are the movement pressures that Europe is having to respond to. Then we've made it worse with the proxy war. That is, we, it wasn't simply um, the crisis of Syrian autocracy, then everybody piled in. Uh, energetically adding flames to the fire. If there's one uh, conclusion that I, as a student of international relations, draw from the Syrian crisis, is the single worst thing you can do in a civil war is try and help one side to win, paradoxically. And we used to think that was the way to bring it to an end quicker. Well, Syria tells you that when you attempt to do that, you simply metastasize uh, a humanitarian uh, catastrophe. And I'd be happy to talk in, in answer to questions about what we might do about Syria, but uh, we'll get there. Let me get to Europe. As you all know, um, Europe is fretting about the burden that it is having to deal with in relation to refugees, but it's apparent that the full burden of the refugee flow is falling on Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. And in terms of thinking, I think one of our difficulties about the refugee issue has been to understand it as a geostrategic challenge and not just a humanitarian one, to understand that this refugee crisis may destroy the uh, public order and state order of Lebanon and Jordan uh, and uh, has profound implications uh, for Turkey. Um, let me then begin to move us towards the core of the subject. Um, refugees began coming ashore 2014, 2015. One of the things that we're all as, and here I speak as if I were a European, I've lived among you for 20, 25 years, I married a European, so I think I'm entitled to use the, the word we. One of the elements of moral shame that needs to be faced uh, from a policy point of view is simply that we're using drowning as a deterrent. Um, the shame of a situation where as we speak someone is drowning uh, off Lampedusa, as we speak someone is drowning trying to get out of a rubber dinghy in the Mediterranean, as we speak we seem to have handled the whole business of transiting from a zone of safety to a zone, from a zone of danger to a zone of safety, we've handed over to crooks. Uh, this is a bad story. It's a bad story. The drowning is a bad story, a moral shame. The, the ways in which we've uh, empowered um, traffickers is a bad story. Um, we have the most powerful navies in the world. We have air reconnaissance capabilities. Somehow we are not putting an end to this. If there's a policy recommendation you would want to make, it's do something to reduce the moral shame of having drowning as the chief deterrent that keeps uh, European borders uh, secure. And then we have, I'm sorry to show this, it, it's distressing even to look at, but that's where it ends up. This is the photograph that more than anything galvanized in my country the, the political response to take in 25,000 refugees. Why Canada? Because this kid and his family were trying to get to Canada. Um, and when Canadians discovered that this family had tried to come to Canada, had had their claims turned down and had then taken the desperate measure of trying to cross into Greece, Canadians felt a galvanic shock that resulted in the taking between November and February of 25,000 uh, refugees. But from the moment of compassionate recognition, which this photograph triggered, to this moment was very, very quick. Within days, in fact, razor wire began to go up in Europe. This is uh, at the Hungarian border. And where Viktor Orban led, the rest of Europe has followed. Uh, and 
I think this begins to take us into the core of my talk, which is why it is that a Europe which began the crisis with a commitment to non-refoulement and a right of asylum has cozied up to a deal with Turkey which, in which we cast a, a blind eye to Erdogan's repression of civil society and human rights in Turkey in return for the dubious promise of uh, immigration uh, refugee control and how state after state after state has closed uh, their border. How did we get here? How did this happen? What, how do we explain this transformation, this movement from uh, compassion to uh, repression? Um, we know that the uh, uh, EU-Turkey deal has reduced the flow, so let's understand what this chart is representing. If you do a rights-violating deal with Turkey, instrumentally, it can help you uh, control the flow. The consequence then is whether that flow will then shift simply to Italy. So we haven't solved any problem at all. We, the, this this uh, chart looks as if we have, but it seems to me uh, we've delayed, postponed, pushed off a problem as Europe often does. Let me now move, uh, and, and in the process of the movement from compassion to repression, one of the things we've all seen has been the ways in which migrants have been, and refugees, have, who are victims in 70 to 80 percent of the cases of civil war, they're fleeing for their lives, they're fleeing persecution, they're fleeing the absolute impossibility, they're fleeing an existential threat. There ever were victims, these, are, these are, can be defined as victims. They've been reinvented as threats. When that move happens, uh, their rights very quickly disappear. That discursive move has been crucial uh, to what's happened in Europe in the last six months. And some of the rationalizations have a kind of Baroque fascination to me. Uh, Victor Orban defending the razor wire as the defense of Christian civilization. Not merely in Hungary, you'll be delighted to know he's protecting Christian civilization for all of you. Uh, the Czech Republic, the Slovaks have used the language of medical necessity closed borders. That is, these, the refugees and migrants pose a health threat to the good people of the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, in Germany, Pegida, an alternative for Deutschland. In France, the Front National. Wilders in the Netherlands. UKIP, it must be said, in this country. And Donald Trump in the United States. Migration has become the hinge issue in the domestic policy politics of every liberal state and every illiberal democracy since September. And we need to understand now the political dynamics of this uh, new trend in our politics. And here I want to uh, begin to set up the contrast that I headlined at the beginning of the talk. The response of, um, and I think of myself as a progressive liberal, has been to reassert a form of moral universalism. And I want to question moral universalism. I want to, this is where it gets uncomfortable. This is the talk is designed to make you uncomfortable because it makes me uncomfortable. Um, in the moral universalist response to the refugee and migration crisis, what we have said is there is no other, there is no stranger, there is only us. Um, according to human rights doctrines, the, the, the universality of human rights resides in the in the conception, in the metaphysics, that the otherness of strangers, their race, their class, their religion, their, their gender, any otherness is morally irrelevant to our determination of their status or of their rights. And in cosmo, many of us pride ourselves in being cosmopolitans, even rootless cosmopolitans, and as cosmopolitans, uh, it is the knowing discourse of every sociology department in every university of the world, that otherness is constructed, that it's a fiction, that it's not real. Um, and in the hospitality ethics we derive from Kant, uh, we do make, Kant makes a 
defini a, a distinction between a citizen and a stranger, but then makes the hospitality that a citizen displays towards a stranger constitutive of what it is to be uh, a, uh, a stranger. There may be a little uh, area there that we will work on uh, later. But the point about moral universalism is the idea that otherness is morally irrelevant and cannot serve as a justification for exclusion. And the duties of common humanity trump the moral claims of political community. And asylum and protection claims to strangers trump uh, the claims of citizens. And it's at that precise moment that the conversation gets difficult, painful, uh, and, un and uncertain. And I want to now contrast the progressive language of moral universalism with what I would call the ordinary virtues perspective. And let me explain why I'm calling it ordinary virtues. Because one of the ways we can get this politics wrong is to think that we're dealing with right-minded uh, moral universalists versus basically nativist um, racists in one way or the other. We can miscategorize. Uh, there is certainly racism out there. There is certainly Islamophobia. Don't make it more complicated than there is. There's some vicious stuff out there. But there's also a broad sector of opinion that I saw, for example, in the Munich railway station in September 2015, of Germans who flooded to the railway station to provide blankets, to provide water, to provide whatever. I'll never forget a, a German a Munich policeman telling, him, telling me with some pride that the Twitter uh, feed on the German, uh, the Munich police uh, uh, system, uh, when the refugees had taken up all the beds, all the bedding that uh, volunteers could provide, all the police had to do was to tweet out that they needed a few more beds, and in a half an hour, beds were literally landing on the forecourts of Munich Station, dropped off by benevolent citizens. Um, and so we look at that benevolence, compassion, generosity, of which there has been an enormous amount in Europe. Uh, it's a huge and precious civic resource. And we then make what I think is a significant but an important mistake. We, we take that to be moral universalism in action. We take this to be a reflection of commitments to moral universality and to human rights. And I think, in fact, something else is going on with that generosity, which we need to understand a little more uh, carefully. My claim is that ordinary virtues are not the domestication of universal values, that they're actually the expression of local virtues. And ordinary virtues privilege the local over the universal, the citizen over the stranger, the community over the cosmopolitan. And what those Bavarians were doing were demonstrating what Bavaria stands for, what Munich stands for, what their community stands for, what their religious group stands for, what they stand for as individuals. They were not vindicating universal asylum rights. They were not vindicating universal human rights principles. They were doing something allied but significantly different. Um, and one of the things about ordinary virtues that seems to me praiseworthy is that the ordinary virtue perspective does not generalize, does not universalize. It particularizes. Its idea of what moral duty involves is one-to-one, -one, individual to individual. Um, it is not interested when it gives hospitality and compassion to a stranger to vindicate a universal proposition about human beings or vindicate a universal proposition about human rights. It's designed to help that individual, to rescue that person, and to instantiate a moral relation that's fundamentally between individual human beings. And, and therefore, for the ordinary virtue perspective, and the ordinary virtue perspective I'm talking about is not <laughs> condescendingly some group of less educated people than us, some other person. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about a fault line within us between commitments to moral universalism and the uneasy relationship that has to generosity, compassion, uh, and our failure to understand these are two different languages and two different approaches uh, to human uh, solidarity.
Okay, that's roughly what I'm trying to talk to you about. Now let me spell out how the ordinary virtues perspective works in practice. In the ordinary virtue perspective that I've seen observationally around the world, this is part of work that I'm doing for the Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs. For ordinary virtue, the moral distinction is between self and other and between stranger and citizen. Otherness, this is my point, otherness is primary. One of the, I think, the, the conceits of someone like me who's taught human rights all my life has been the unstated belief that human identity, human commonality is primary. In fact, in the ordinary virtue perspective that I've observed around the world, actually it's otherness and difference is primary. And when people engage in generous actions towards others, they're not vindicating, they're not acting on the belief that what they are doing is engaging with another human being. They're engaging with a particular individual for purposes and agendas that can only be understood in individual terms. Difference is primary, commonality is conditional, and it's negotiated. And an encounter, human being to human being, can become an encounter between human being and human being. And it can, it can create that sense of a common human identity, but often that encounter can destroy that common recognition altogether. And I think one of the, 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 the strengths of an ordinary virtue perspective, morally, has been its intransigently anti-ideological and anti-universalizing character and its insistence on the sovereignty of individual judgment. Let me tell you a story to illustrate that. Uh, my mother, long dead, but much lamented and much loved, used to say that her ideal of a perfect world was a world in which all dislike was personal. It's a deeply wise remark. That is, if I dislike Mark, it's not because he's a white, middle-aged, privileged male. I just don't like him. <laughs> Just, you know, it, it's what he says and does I don't like. You know. It's not your race, it's not your gender, Mark, it's not your shoes, it, it's just you. you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And we, <laughs> I thought, and, and, and my point is there's something very human and very important there. And some of the reaction against what is regarded as coercive political correctness is a reaction against a sense that there's a universal obligation to tolerance towards persons who are different, regardless of their individual characteristics. And there's a neuralgic resentment about that, which, which is defensible to the degree that it's a defense of the sovereignty of individual judgment. Can I be free to choose whether I like this black man? Can I be free to choose whether I'm happy with this uh, Muslim woman as my neighbor? And symmetrically, vice versa. So this is, a, this is where the ordinary virtues perspective is not in happy dialogue with moral universalism and universalist obligations of, of toleration. And here, when you translate this into the language of integration in multicultural societies, a citizen, whether born here or acquiring citizenship, insists that the transaction of integration has to recognize that it is the citizen who defines the terms, not the stranger. The citizen will integrate the stranger, but only on the recognition of the citizen's sovereignty, that is, their uh, political and sovereign power. And the citizen will recognize the stranger not as, and welcome them into uh, Britain or any political community, not in recognition of common humanity, but in recognition of their potential as potential members of a, a de determinate political community. And by political community, I don't mean Europe. I don't want to enter into the Brexit Remain debate. Let me tell you, I'm fervently for Remain. But the issue we're debating here is what, where is the political community? And the, the citizens we're talking about are the citizens of determinate national states. And the political membership that they either accord or do not accord is the determinate membership of determinate states in Europe, not Europe in general. 
and the integration process is also a form of civic contract in which the citizen says yes to the stranger on condition that the stranger says yes to the citizen and to the political order uh, of which they are a part. Liberal pluralists like me are uneasy at this point. The, all of you are thinking, okay, what does yes mean here, right? And that's a question we haven't quite answered. And the reason we have difficulty answering it is we don't know what yes means for us. In a liberal pluralist society, you know, there's 65% of British life, you know, if I were a citizen, I'd like to change and say no to, right? Any, any Brit, any Frenchman, any German at any given moment is not saying a full-throated yes to their society. They're saying a very conditioned, moderated question one. And on the grounds of liberal freedom, you don't want to have a yes that you ask of a stranger that you would not ask symmetrically of a citizen, right? This is why the question of integration poses such difficulties for a liberal pluralist. But a citizen, most citizens believe, I understand, I feel your pain about liberal pluralism, but I want to de determine the, the, the terms of this civic bargain. And if the stranger says, uh, uh, says no, uh, the contract is uh, canceled. There's no unlimited obligation to both recognize and acknowledge a stranger's whatever. It's conditional on their saying yes to the terms and conditions of citizenship. And I'll say more about what I think the yes has to mean in a minute. Um, and here we begin to get uh, closer to the core of, of, of my talk. When you think about what toleration is from an ordinary virtues perspective, a citizen thinks of toleration not as a universal obligation at all, but as a gift, a gift relationship. I accord toleration to you. I welcome you to my community. And it's a very transactional, very one-by-one -one kind of matter. Don't ask me to tolerate all kinds and conditions of human beings. My, con my toleration is conditional on the performance of their is conditional on their behavior. I go down to their shop, I buy something at the sh store, if the price is fair, um, if we exchange a few pleasant words, in a molecular process, toleration is established and reproduced and multicultural society depends on the infinite expansion of these molecular instances of mutual recognition and mutual uh, toleration. And the civic toleration that results is not some <coughs> recognition of shared common humanity, but a recognition of that we're all playing by more or less the same rules, which gets us to the yes. And toleration, therefore, is an individual virtue, not a normative universalizing commitment at all. And the virtue, the positive aspect of ordinary virtue to me is is that moral instinct. You take them one at a time. You take people one at a time. And it's all strictly personal. And that gets back to my mother's uh, utopia. Um, and this leads to an important political conclusion, which is that for international lawyers, and there's some very distinguished ones in the room, so I approach here with fear and trembling. In international law, if asylum itself is not a right, non-refoulement is most definitely a right, and it's an obligation of states, and international law, here comes the analytical point, states do have discretion in the determination of your status in asylum. That is, do you qualify, do you qualify, do you qualify, do you qualify, do you qualify? But if all of you qualify, the obligation is you all get in all of you, everyone in this room. And this is the political problem that Angela Merkel has backed into. The constitutional law of Germany uh, requires her to respect the international asylum obligations of the German Federal Republic. That means that if 
if there are a million people with a well-founded fear of persecution as determined by the German state, they all get in. And that is what she's finding politically impossible. A straight contradiction, in other words, between the universality of a human rights obligation and the political demands of the political community that elects her. And this conflict uh, is at the core of the, um, of the difficulty. And the key source of the political support that there is for saying the house is full is actually a premise that we have not named and surfaced sufficiently and understood, those of us who defend liberal universalism, is that most of our fellow citizens, and perhaps some of us, don't believe that asylum is a right. We think it's a gift. And those of you who have, remember the, that most wonderful uh, example of British social science, Richard Titmus's The Gift Relationship, a truly magnificent book, we ought to open it up and read it again. Because a, a gift relationship, as opposed to a rights relationship, a gift relationship is discretionary. A gift is a scarce good. You give it to some, but not to others. And it's you to decide who you give the gift to. Now, if asylum is conceived as a gift, we have a whole different political perspective on the problems we've got. We've got much more normative resistance to asylum as a right than I think we, we assumed. And my point here is not to say people are right to think of asylum as a gift. I'm just trying to understand two competing definitions of political reason here that we need to uh, think about. Um, gracious me, what's happened to my, ah, there we go. Um, let me just summarize here. Um, in domestic law, rights, have legitimacy because they're democratically decided limits to majority rule, defended by, from majority rule by an independent judiciary, free press, and informed citizenry. That's the contract of liberal uh, democracy. In international law, rights are limits to state discretion, but their legitimacy is grounded in state consent. And so asylum rights have, have legitimacy to international lawyers and state parties and, and governments because they have domestic consent and they have international ratification. And it's on that basis that they ought to trump majoritarian opposition uh, by citizens. But when you see the same perspective from an ordinary virtue perspective, you see something completely different. You see the government, and I'm talking about the middle frame of, 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 of often liberal opinion. Governments ought to be generous, ought to be compassionate, they ought to be compassionate in public as we ought to be compassionate and generous in private. But asylum is a gift, not a right. A government's asylum conditions are, obligations are primarily to citizens and only secondarily to strangers. And when governments have to choose, they must, on majoritarian principles, choose um, the priorities of citizens. And when citizens' consent fractures under the pressure of numbers, governments should abridge, not merely must abridge or unfortunately have to, but must abridge asylum uh, obligations. And all of this is uncomfortable territory for me and it may be for you, but it seems to me we need to think through the deep political rationale of the political firestorm that migration and refugee claims are making. Now, needless to say, ordinary virtue is then politicized in often wicked ways. The Hungarian government, um, I've ne I, I couldn't believe when this was done to me, I said, you know, why are you guys in Hungary shutting and putting up razor wire? And he said, and I said, doesn't the razor wire reflect very badly on Hungary? And the government minister said to me, but we were so, all of our citizens were so generous at Budapest railway station, we handed out water. You see the ways in which the ordinary generosity and compassion of Hungarian citizens is being used by a populist government to turn against um, uh, the universality of, of rights. And citizens uh, collude with governments in construing asylum obligations as a discretionary gift. And then, and now we get to the Daily Mail, anti-migration me media then 
resume a very old discourse that's host hostile to rights, Bentham's uh, discourse about rights being nonsense on stilts. And then you get the, the little social touch, which is distinctively British, which is the effect that rights discourse is an elite discourse, separated from the common sense of ordinary virtue. You begin to see that uh, driving very strongly. And in Britain, because you have a great tradition of parliamentary sovereignty, that then codes very quickly to a defense of British exceptionalism, British specificity, British difference from continental rights regime. And then without anybody noticing, democracy becomes the defining claim to shut the door on refugees and migrants. And some of this is surfacing in the Brexit campaign, I hardly need tell you. So then the question, and I am coming to a conclusion and hope you will get up and disagree with everything I've said and the, one of the reasons that someone like me gives a lecture like this is not is to learn and I hope I will learn from your comments and suggestions. The question is then what do we do given this if, if my analysis of the political problem uh, we have about migration and refugees is right then what do we do? I think a liberal Democratic progressive has to address the integration issue head on and say yes, that's how we understand it. We say yes to you on condition you say yes to us. And the yes is essentially a full-throated commitment to the liberal constitutional order. I mean, to law and order, to the rule of law, but above all, to the rule of law. We don't and shouldn't ask um, uh, strangers with different customs, different faiths, different religions, different to say yes to the lot, but we do have a right, even an obligation in my view, to insist that they say yes to the liberal constitutional order. I think the other thing that will help us in our arguments with generous, uh, generous fellow citizens who feel their compassion and generosity is at a an end, uh, it will help if we stop uh, lecturing them about the universal values of political correctness towards other people. We need to connect to a sense of showing respect for the sovereignty of their judgment and asking them only, please take people one at a time. Take them as they come. Um, I think the other thing that we need to do is to change a language from um, uh, we don't need to abandon the language of rights, and I'll say a minute a bit more about specifically what rights talk we must not abandon. But I do think we need to think, we need to appeal to the better angels of our fellow citizens' nature, to appeal to hospitality, to appeal to generosity, to appeal uh, to compassion. It is really striking how relentlessly economistic the language uh, gets here. As if we think, well, if we can provide some argument from interest, if we can argue, provide some argument from the demography of an aging society, we can create a political consensus in favor of migration and refugees. That just seems to me to misunderstand what's at stake. We need to appeal to the better nature of our fellow citizens and hospitality to strangers, generosity to strangers, compassion to strangers, seems to me an unexploited uh, moral reservoir. And then finally, something else that needs to be said. Um, Hannah Arendt spoke about the right to have rights. Um, you have rights as a citizen, you have rights as a human being. When you lose your rights as a citizen, you may have to depend on the rights you have as a human being. And one of the things we really do need to say, and I say this with some feeling because I'm the son and grandson of refugees, Russian refugees, who came to this country and were given a welcome in 1919 in a state of desperation, is it's, it's pretty important to emphasize um, moral reciprocity and just simply say it could be you. It could be you. It's very difficult for British people in, in an island that's you know been safe from turmoil for centuries to understand that sense of reciprocal vulnerability. 
But we do live in a world in which it could be you, in which you could lose your rights as a citizen and some suddenly be, as Shakespeare said in King Lear, on the heath, desperate, alone. Um, and that sense of it could be you seems to me to be a, a reservoir um, from a, a moral point of view we need to, we need to uh, argue for. Let me then, in slightly more policy terms, because thus far I've simply been talking about discourse, and you'll be r immensely relieved to know this is my last slide. I think we need to, human rights and liberal progressives need to confront head on the problem of maintaining sovereign consent for asylum rights. And that means, in the first place, defining what yes must mean. Uh, our fellow citizens want us to have a civic contract with strangers in which the yes crucially involves respect for the rule of law. The rights that we must absolutely uh, maintain, and we must maintain them without apology as counter-majoritarian uh, principles that should not be open to political trade-off, is individual determination of status and non-refoulement to societies that will persecute or torture. And those two principles uh, of international law seem to me foundational and are anti-majoritarian. That is, in the strict sense, they will come under a lot of pressure. Do generalized determination, kick all the Syrians out or kick all the Iraqis out or kick all the Muslims out? No, you got to do it one by one. The, the moral intuition of individual determination is a statement of the the retail importance of individual rights that must never be sacrificed, and ditto uh, with refoulement to torture and places of persecution. But in turn, in return, it seems to me, liberal progressives have been too hesitant to talk about the quid pro quo, which is effective border control on the one hand, and, and rule-based repatriation and return. The one thing a, a, a liberal democratic society, and this is based with feeling a feeling example from the United States, you don't want to have people turn down for status in this country and then drift into the nether world of illegal, undocumented migration. The United States has 15 million of these people. What you do is you create a, uh, a discriminatory labor market. Uh, it is a human rights nightmare, it seems to me. But the quid pro quo of that is if you fail if you fail to meet the criteria for admission and your remedies are exhausted, you have to go home. And, and, and Europe simply can't maintain effective border control without rule-based return and repatriation. In addition, uh, there has to be multilateral aid for safe third world, third countries. One of the moral disgraces of this whole refugee story has been that UNHCR, World Food Program, all the outfits that have basically been trying to care for refugees in the frontline states are 48% funded. I mean, come on guys, that isn't hard, that can be fixed. And that's not just for the European Union, that's also crucially for the United States, which is the biggest donor for front, uh, third, uh, safe third world country uh, settlement uh, for refugees, but otherwise the United States has been a bystander here. The other thing the United States and Canada and Commonwealth countries and Latin American countries and other countries will have to do is start taking some of the refugee burden from uh, uh, Europe. Um, the other thing, again, that's going to be difficult for us, but seems to me to be longer term, is the extreme importance of getting um, internationally mandated and validated legal migration streams for temporary migration. Well, you get a biometric identifier that says you come into the United Kingdom on June the 1st, 2016. We got your, we got your vital statistics here and you're, you're here lawfully until June the 1st, 2019. And if we find you in this country after the expiry of your, your admission date, you never get back in here again, right? So you encourage uh, the migration streams that are such an important, crucial source of remittance income, but you enforce it with 21st century technology. We also need to change, and this is a subject that the, um, Oxford has been a world leader on, is developing new regimes 
for survival migration. We have the 51 Convention, but we don't have um, international regimes for people fleeing f in fear of their lives from catastrophic climate change, natural disaster, uh, civil war, and state collapse. And then we need, finally, um, something that seems to me crucial uh, to the future um, of the demographic profile of our societies, permanent immigration streams for family reunification and demographic renewal. That put together uh, gives us something that I think will take us to a different place. But we need to engage critically with the politics of this constantly, with arguments that reach those who are afraid, reach those who are doubtful, reach those who feel their compassion is at an end, reach those with generosity. And we need to start doing some very simple things, which is, you know, I've, be, I've just been here for a week. I've lived in, you know, Britain for 20 odd years. I married someone who's a British citizen. I love this country. I owe it an enormous amount. But you can't get up in the morning and have your breakfast served by a Polish uh, hardworking uh, lady or have your, the, your hotel um, room cleaned by a you know, hardworking Romanian and then turn on the television and see a discourse in which those strangers are being stigmatized, ostracized, turned into threats. It's beneath the greatest liberal democracy in the world. Just stop it. Thanks very much. I think we've now got time for questions, and uh, there are some apparently roving mics. So if, uh, yes, you like to take. I'm happy to try and just speak louder. It probably won't work for people at the back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, um, is that on? Um, yeah. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, uh, my name is Will Jones, I work at the Refugee Studies Centre. Um, I think a lot of this idea of an ordinary values approach is exactly what we need to constructively change the discourse in Britain around refugees. It occurs to me that the language of things like taking people one at a time, as they come, uh, things like that, works extremely well for undergirding an ordinary values approach to asylum. But if you look at the international refugee regime, it occurs to me that the right of asylum is imperfectly but comparatively very well entrenched, very well judicialized, uh, and very well protected. The bit that is very badly institutionalized is burden sharing. The idea that people in Britain would help out the Greek state, or that people in Canada would help out Italy. And I guess my question would be, do the same ordinary values work in that context? I mean, reciprocity, I suppose, comes close, but it's really hard to say to British people or Canadian people, you might be Greece. I don't think they'll believe you. Uh, so, so do we need, do the same ordinary values help, or do we need different ordinary values to try and persuade people to engage in responsibility sharing? That's a very acute comment, which is the kind of thing a speaker says when he's playing desperately for time. Um, it's also true. Um, I think everybody, uh, I've certainly, uh, I'm a kind of infuriated European, that is a European who wants Europe to succeed and is constantly infuriated by how badly it's doing and where it's doing astonishingly badly is in uh, the collapse of burden sharing. Uh, it seems like a, a, a pathology of uh, democracy in the sense the only political community with which citizens identify is their own language community, their own national community, and uh, it's very difficult to get um, anybody to imagine what it's like to be Greece. And so Greece, bit by bit, is being converted into a very large, safe third country transit camp with no end in sight. And that is actually a disgrace. And the other disgrace, and I'm, I'm not going to give you an answer because I actually, I, I really don't know what to do here. Um, Hungary, which is a country I know a little bit about, sends 500,000 <coughs> Hungarians into Western Europe to work, benefits enormously from uh, the European project, um, receives about six billion dollars, uh, euros, 
into its coffers every year from various common funds, so is a net beneficiary of the European Union, and takes not one refugee, right? I mean, this is the collapse of, of, of pan-European solidarity we're talking about. As a practical matter, uh, I just think burden sharing has collapsed. I, I simply don't see any way to get it back. I don't and, and some of the proposals that are made, which is you will, will, will levy a 250,000 euro fine per refugee, you know, this is not gonna work. This is not gonna work. And it may blow uh, uh, Europe uh, apart. I don't see burden sharing working. And what also alarms me is that there's no burden sharing in a thing that I took for granted my entire adult life, which was the North Atlantic Alliance. That is the presence of the United States as a one of the key conditions of European unity and un European solidarity has been American investment in this, con not, uh, you know, strategic investment in the country. Um, you know, the United States has taken, what, 3,000, 4,000 <coughs> Syrian refugees since the crisis began. Um, you would have thought that one of the motives for solidarity and burden sharing is to leverage your sovereign power. You know, that is, if ethics won't do it, um, uh, um, interest might, that is the United States interest in stepping into the refugee crisis is to assert its global leadership. Not even that's working. So I'm throwing the question back at you in a sense. I, I, I'm finding it um, disturbing and I'm also not convinced that asylum is as safe as you suppose. It seems to me that there are lots of examples where the asylum right is admitted in international law, and then states use their discretionary power to whittle it down to vanishing point. The extreme case of that being Australia, really, where you declare huge zones of, you know, the, 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 the offshore territory of Australia is non-jurisdictional, so nobody landing there can claim Asylum, well that's an example of what lots of people are doing. Uh, the Hungarians have put the razor wire up to make, no to make no asylum claims possible. And I have heard scholars tell me we're looking at the death of asylum. So I'm even more pessimistic than you are. Not merely the death of burden sharing in Europe, but also the death of asylum more generally. I fervently hope that's not the case. But that's where I see it. And I'm trying to engage with the key problem, which is what languages do you use to mobilize a broad center of opinion that might be enlisted to move this thing? And I don't, I don't know. Thanks very much. Um uh, I teach international refugee law, so it's probably going to be uh, 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 go, going against the grain of uh, what you, you were trying to achieve. I mean, um, I suppose the, the, the thing that stuck to me when, when you were talking about um, mobilizing publics is, is the notion of sovereign consent and which is, which is the polity. And then I want to try and link it to, to the question of Europe and, and the European Union, because you mentioned the example of Hungarians having a right to free movement in Europe. And of course, many states are a part of a Schengen border free zone. And so the same way there was a very strong reaction when 30 governors in the United States says, well, the United States may accept refugees, but we're not going to welcome them into our states. And there was an argument from law saying, well, you can't under American law. Um, there could be um, a strain of argument that would lead to similar arguments uh, within the European space. And so w what I wonder is, um, do you see proposals to have a European refugee uh, and migration agency, which would then take on itself to do those in individual refugee status termination processes and then have mandatory um, allocation to different states um, with a view to this being a region that has a common European asylum system and that has free movement to some extent um, as, a, as, a, as a positive direction or, or as a breach of sovereign consent? I just think the 
the political support for a common European asylum regime and an institution that would then, you know, um, take these, uh, protect asylum for all 28 membership, member countries and then administer it, which is kind of where you're going and Guy Goodwin Gill and all kinds of great people here at Oxford have proposed this. I just think it's, it's just not on the realm of political possibility at the moment. And, and what's perverse about that is that it's actually in the interest of, of states to do that in the sense if you don't, then Greece gets stuck, you know, then Italy gets stuck, you know, Germany does a unilateral, basic, they call it a European deal, it was a straight bilateral deal with Turkey. The minute you do that, then it has balloon effects on Italy. So all of the Europeans are looking at that and seeing it's Sovkipa re-sovereignization, if I can use an ugly word, of this political problem, driven by domestic electorates that have essentially gone back to the sovereign state because the, the transnational projects have all failed. I mean, that's kind of where we are at the moment. And I'm trying to emphasize that the transnational project was not just some fruity, sentimental dream. It, it properly understood really did serve the interests of sovereign states better than individual sovereigns trying to do that. But I just think we're now in a situation where it's too late. If you ask, you know, who's going to take in refugee and asylum claims in Europe right now? There's one state, one, basically, Germany in any volume that makes any damn difference. And, and this is catastrophic. And so when, when people say, you know, if, uh, <laughs> if Brexit were to occur, you pile that on to what I'm talking about, and it's not clear to me the European project can survive the next two years, actually. And I say that with sorrow. I mean, I just, but I, I, I just think you gotta look this stuff in the face, and my only sense of politics is the only way back is to begin working from the base of, of, of the political consent that re needs to be re-founded in these states um, by appealing to the ordinary virtues, uh, by emphasizing the reciprocal value of rights respect, and by pointing out the thing that you're get getting at, which is that we can't fix this alone. We just can't. You know. Professor, thank you so much for coming. My name's Alessia, I'm an MPP student, one of Will's students, so this might be <laughs> sort of along his lines. Um, but I had a. I wanted to push back one second on what you mentioned about Hungary, and obviously we've all seen, you know, the the wires and the the opposition and populist government. Um, but actually, when you look at the the voluntary quota system that was put through by the European Commission, Hungary was one of the countries that pledged the highest number of uh, of places for for migrants and refugees, for refugees. So my question is, could this be not a problem of practicality? But a problem of ideology. You mentioned that, you know, asylum isn't a right anymore, it's seen as a gift. But could it just be a conflict of rights between the rights of citizens, of the, let's say non-strangers, and the rights of strangers? Is it that citizens are reclaiming their rights from their own states of saying, you've given us austerity, <laughs> you've taxed us higher, hold on a second, first provide us for our own rights, and then let's provide asylum seekers with the rights that they, they do deserve, because as you say, some European citizens have also shown huge amounts of solidarity towards asylum seekers. Thank you. I think uh, some of what you're saying sounds absolutely right. I, I'd probably quarrel with the numbers on Hungary. My sense is Hungary has shut it down. Um, but uh, if I'm wrong, I'm happy to stand corrected. My sense is that uh, paradoxically, Orban was in a uh, difficult political context on the 24th of August, September 2015, and by the 15th of August, he was back in business. Razor wire, let's face it, turned out to be very, very popular domestically in Hungary. Much as I hate to say it, wish it weren't true, don't agree with it. Um, zero burden sharing uh, has been politically 
very effective uh, line uh, across Europe. Um, and you get to uh, countries like Denmark where you actually have people passing legislation saying, um, we'll check your necklaces at the door in order to pay for your integration. You think, do these people have no historical memory of Denmark's historic role in saving their Jews in 1942? I mean, you just can't believe what you're looking at. And we need to look at, at it in all its, its grimness. I'm trying to find some rays of light here. Uh, I'm trying to get us to remember the generosity that is still out there uh, in the German public, in, in many parts of the British public, uh, in civil society. Uh, but there's simply no doubt, I think, that the migration crisis, to get a little theoretical for a moment, the, the migration crisis also comes on top of two other preceding crises. You referred to austerity, and that's a good instinct. Um, I talked about the re-sovereignization of European politics. Some of it, I think, is three things that happened in serial order. 9-11 and then the, then the European mass casualty attacks. The minute you get hit by terrorists, the one thing you know is you want the state to protect you. The state rushes back. And any fantasies you've had that you can do without a coercive liberal state vanish. The demand for protection is imperative. And that's massively increased the power of European sovereign states, number one. Then number two is the the economic crisis of 2008, where any fantasy you had that liberal markets are self-correcting and self-policing and self-cleansing and that the destruction is all you know, constructive destruction, went out the window. And people, one of the enduring consequences of 2008 has been a demand for sovereign regulation of markets. And then the third bump has been migration which basically sovereigns, uh, citizens are saying, control the border. What the hell is this country if I can't get control of borders? And I think a liberal progressive response that doesn't respond positively for the need for lawful, just, humane, but effective border control doesn't understand this chain of anxiety and fear that the last 15 years has done and has undermine confidence in the European project because Europe's not going to protect you from anything. Uh, uh, you go back to the, to, to the sovereign state. And you prioritize citizens over strangers. And I think to add a fourth element, which is again very uncomfortable, one of the hidden ironies of the post-war welfare state you know, I'm a welfareist. I think it's, you know, T.H. Marshall and, and, and kind of social citizenship is one of the great historic achievements in, reconception, in reconceiving what the liberal state should be. It then connected citizenship to entitlement and to welfare. And so the minute you get strangers coming in, the key question for a citizen is, am I looking at a free rider? Somebody who's taking out, whereas I'm putting in. And so, oddly, the welfare state designed to create social solidarity has, has acted in such a way to reproduce the division between citizen and stranger in ways that we're still struggling to, to understand. One more. Uh, uh, in a very short time, Europe is going to be confronted with a choice, isn't it, between either breaking the law uh, of international asylum or having to sort out between its constituent members who's going to take how many, because under the Dublin Convention, the primary obligation to determine asylum applications falls on the country in which the asylum seeker first arrives. Uh, if a million people continue to arrive in Greece and Italy, that system will break down. Uh, and um, there are only two options. Either the countries of Europe stop recognizing the right of asylum, 
or those million people, or however many it's going to be in the coming years, are going to have to be dealt with uh, in a variation of the Dublin Convention by different European countries. There is no third, third option, is there? That summarizes the situation very accurately. And it's extremely concerning. Um, and this is becoming a case where muddling through is not fixing the problem. I mean, European, you know, I'm an anti-perfectionist, I'm anti-planning, I'm a pauperian, I'm in favor of, you know, you, you make a mistake, you correct, you think, and, and Europe has assembled itself on the basis of making mistakes, correcting them, getting, but we're moving into a situation where the acceleration of this problem, as you describe, is very quickly presenting us with um, a couple of options, all of which will be extremely ugly. One of them is we simply turn Greece into a very large refugee camp, we turn Turkey into a very large refugee camp, and we turn a blind eye to Erdogan's repression of the fundamental rights of, of his citizens. Um, we start effectively mass and collective deportations back to countries in violation of what I was saying, which is individual asylum determination is crucial. We will break the non-refoulement rules because we'll send people back to lots of places where they will be either tortured or abused. And it will be so keep uh, politics. And this is why this is such a, a serious uh, matter. And I'm, um, that's why I, I think there are lots of things that international lawyers can do. I think there are lots of things that the European Commission will have to do. Um, I think there's lots of stuff, as I've said, that the United States is gonna have to do to, to, to step in. Um, but the key driver, it seems to me, is, is uh, civic debate and re-engagement. And I've just said how frightened these citizens, how frightened we are, actually both of what you describe, but antecedent fears that are making it extremely difficult for, to, for, for us to act with prudence. Um, so, God, I've been depressing. I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm actually, I, I do want to... I, I, yeah, I think we all need a drink. I, I do want to say I'm, I'm a, a tremendous optimist in politics, all appearances to the contrary. Um, I, I don't think this will necessarily turn out uh, right on the night, but I, but I would say that if you do three of these lectures as I've done all week, um, without being sentimental and without overpraising myself, but this seeks to praise you, um, this really is up to us folks. It really is up to democratic discussion and debate. And you're, you're having the debate of the generation that's essentially about this issue. So for God's sake, get it right. <laughs> That's, I think we'll stop there. For the part. So, uh, a few moments. Uh, please exit, and there are refreshments out there in the foyer, and, well, you'll be, you'll be directed towards them. But I wondered if you'd just stay still while we process out of the lecture theatre. But before we do even that, perhaps we can uh, thank Professor Ignatia for an enormously stimulating lecture, for depressing us all thoroughly, and to really sharpening up the, the moral complexity that we're all faced with here. So thank you very much.